Right. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to this evening's talk um, by, by Clive Belton. Uh, Clive, Clive tells me he's a local lad, born and brought up in Bristol. He worked for Wessex Water for a number of years, um, but then left and worked on his own as a, a manager and consultant. He tells me he's semi-retired in 2010, but hearing the number of things he's been doing since then, I'm not sure he's terribly retired. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he's basically interested in anything to do with, uh, with Bristol and its history. So um, I'm sure this evening's talk will be very fascinating. Okay, Clive, it's all yours. Lovely, okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, uh, and to, to Jackie and the team for asking me to come along uh, this evening to say a, say a few words. I'm assuming everybody can see my uh, opening um, uh, screen presentation, the, 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 the heading, uh, Harry Dolman, the millionaire who invented, um, who was Mr. Bristol City. Well, this is, um, yeah, this is uh, quite an eclectic story, really, because I, um, it came about when in, I think it was 20, 2016, uh, the M Shed Museum in, in, in Bristol was celebrating its fifth anniversary. Um, and as a, uh, a supporter and contributor to some of the objects uh, within M Shed, um, I was asked to come along as one of the guests for the little celebratory evening. And uh, holding a glass of wine, a, a, a lady next to me rang, rang a few bells. And um, turns out that the lady was Marina Dolman, president of Bristol City Football Club. Um, and being a lifelong Bristol City fan, I so I certainly engaged her in a conversation about A, why, why was she there and, and why was I there really? Um, and so that's how this story started because um, I asked Marina um, quite pointedly really, has, has anybody done a book on, on Harry Dolman who was former chairman of Bristol City Football Club and she gripped me by the wrist and said no dear do you think anybody would be interested and of course yes they would um, and so um, I met Marina with my colleague Martin Powell um, a few weeks later and we kicked around a few ideas and, and Marina said she'd like uh, Martin and I to research and write the story of Harry's life so that is what we did. And so that's how this, um, how this particular um, presentation talk really came about from that conversation with Marina uh, at the M Shed Museum in, in 2016. So just a, a few words about, um, about Harry Dolman. He was born in a pub called uh, the Brewery Tap in a Wiltshire village called Langley Burrow in um, 1897, uh, some time ago. Um, and Harry, well, he, he was a, a farmer's lad, really. He li lived, on a, um, lived on a farm with his family in just outside Chippenham. And his first job as a 14-year-old when he left school was with a company called Saxby and Farmer. Um, and they were a fairly heavy engineering business, uh, did a lot of work for the, the railway industry uh signs and appliances and so forth and the image in front of you on the left is um the the, the factory in chippenham where uh, where harry started started his uh, his working life now harry was as as was typical in in those days had a his parents had a fairly fairly large family um there's his mum and dad uh, on the left um harry had uh, four brothers and uh, and two sisters and interestingly during the, the the research for for the book or the story i came across the same image um as on the left but a, a newspaper image on on the right and it was a a postcard by a chap called nigel bowen who lived in chippenham um who many years ago um posted this photograph in the local newspaper to say it was a postcard he came across and uh, didn't know who the family were and if anybody could help him out with that please could they get in touch um well in fact it's marina dolman gave me this clipping and and believe it or not i actually traced nigel bowen and i phoned him up to say 
could he remember this this postcard that he put in the newspaper some 25 years earlier and he said yes and I've still got it and I said do you know who's in that image he says no I said well I'll tell you so I was able to um uh answer a mystery that he'd had for you know 20 plus years about who who was in this uh this lovely family photograph I should say at this point in talking to to, to Marina Martin and Powell and I spent many probably every two to three weeks we would go to where she lives currently in, in Easter Compton and sit she lives on a, a a farm building with with her sister and uh, we, we'd go over every couple of weeks uh, interview Marina about her life and times with Harry and progressively as she got more confident and trusted us not to spill the family beans if you like she she gave us loads of information and at one point she she explained that she was sorry how Harry's handwritten notes of his life that he was penning uh, just before he died very sorry that she didn't have those available because she'd lost them many years earlier however on one of our uh, later visits um Marina produced a, a, a brown um, plastic bag and in that plastic bag she's bringing out more photographs and then she brought out a folder containing Harry's handwritten notes so uh, at that point she got quite emotional but it was brilliant from a writing a, a, a biography point of view to actually be presented with Harry's own handwritten notes of, of his life and time so uh, that was a really great discovery it, it, we had to change tack slightly on how we did the book, but to be honest, that didn't matter because having a biography largely in the hand of the person we were talking about was was priceless. Anyway, Harry Harry um, actually joined the Royal U uh, Wiltshire Yeomanry in in 1913 um, as a, a territorial. And so you can see the yeomanry in uh, Chippenham High Street on, on the left and on the right, a lovely image of Harry in his uh, wearing with his swagger cane in his uh, Royal Wiltshire Yeomanry uniform, probably at a, a territorial camp um, uh, in around 1913 or 1914, not long before the start really of uh, World War One. And I'm a, quite a, an enthusiast for that period, and I've written a few books on um, people involved in the First World War and, and more generally um, about Bristol in the First World War. So that really appealed to me enormously. Um, and then Marina proceeded to dig out some more images of, of, of uh, Harry at that time. And his brother, his elder brother, was also um, actually in the Gloucestershire Regiment. So this is another family photograph. Um, from the early part of the First World War period, around 1918-1919, um, that's what it is. Um, and this was a lovely, lovely image. Harry, and he was quite a short man. Harry on his on his horse, and in his um, in his handwritten notes, he talks about enlisting um, in August 1914, just after the war breaks out, enlisting at the uh, yeomanry headquarters in Chippenham and taking his horse along to that enlistment and the commanding officer of the unit at the time thought Harry's horse was tremendous so he requisitioned it for the for the war effort so poor old Harry uh, lost his horse pretty much on the day he enlisted but I've just recounted briefly um, ha Harry's military career because the first sort of two years he was uh, after his initial training uh, he, he actually served on the Western Front, but because yeomanry and cavalry units were not necessarily pushed to the front line because it was a different type of warfare um, that rarely saw a cavalry charge, for example, um, he spent most of his time in the, in the back lines in support, as a lot of those yeomanry units did. Um, but he was um, a stickler for wanting to get on, uh, as well as his early engineering with uh, the engineering company he was with, he was really keen to become an officer. So he badgered um, his superiors. Um, he became a footman for one of the uh, officers of uh, the regiment. 
Um, and he was he was recommended for a commission. And so in December 1917, he um, actually won uh, a commission to be to go to officer training. So he went to officer training college, which I'll show you an image of that shortly. Um, and between August 1918 and the end of the war, he was actually assigned to the Royal Air Force. And by the time the war ended, Harry was training to be a pilot in the RAF. Um, he never got his wish to fly because the war ended in November 18. Um, he was demobilized in October 1919, but he was allowed to keep his um, rank of second lieutenant. Um, but he, he really enjoyed his, I think, the rigor and discipline of, of army life. And he wanted to, to still have an involvement. And he re-enlisted in the, the uh, Wiltshire Yeomanry again in 1920. But a year later, as his sort of career took off, uh, he actually came out of the territorials. So that was a brief canter through um, Harry's uh, mil military life. But whilst he was um, at Aldershot, um, at Aldershot Command, he actually played in the, the, the football team and he was a very good, uh, very good striker. And Marina came up with that photograph um, on the far left. And here's the officer training college um, at Oxford in February 1918. Um, I won't pick Harry out, but I can assure you he's uh, one of the lads sitting in the middle um, with the officers in training. And you can always tell an officer cadet because they have a white band uh, across their across their cap. Now, in 1919, uh, September 1919, Harry got married to um, Doris. And this was a photograph out, outside of his um, parents' pub in Langley Borough. Um, and again, this is a lovely photograph that Marina found in, in, in her collection. Um, and Harry is in the middle there. Actually, the uniform he's wearing is, is the Gloucestershire Regiment because when he was decommissioned from the RAF, he was actually assigned to the Gloucesters. Um, so the cap badge is that of the, um, of the Gloucestershire Regiment. Um, and he was allowed, you know, to wear that uniform at various functions, including including his marriage. Now, Doris and Harry uh, rented rooms in Bristol uh, after they got married um, in Bellevue Road in Easton, which is um, pictured on the bottom left. Um, and he actually joined. He moved on from Saxby's and he joined Bretnell, Munro and Rogers as a, a junior draftsman. And he carried on his um, academic or technical training at the Merchant Ventures Technical College, um, which was in Unity Street in, in Bristol, just at the bottom of um, Park Street. If you take a left before you get to the centre, you go into Unity Street. And that building you can see is still, is still there today. I think it's student accommodation now. But Brecknell, Munro and Rogers, they were engineers. They were still involved with the um, uh, with the railway, well, I said still involved, but involved with the railway industry that uh, Harry was used to in his days um, at Saxby's. Um, and they were based in Eastern in Bristol and in Pennywell Road. Um, so the east eastern suburbs of Bristol was where Brecknell's had a, a, a very big presence and at the time were a very major manufacturer and, and, and employer. But Harry certainly had an amazing um, inventive mind and he had to his name alone nearly 100 patents in the name of Harry Dolman as an individual or Harry Dolman uh, as an employee of the company he was working for. Um, this was uh, the patent specification for his very first ever uh, invention, a revolving cylinder internal combustion engine when he was living in Bellevue Road. Um, he came up with the application in 1922. So just as a 25 year old or there or thereabouts. Um, and from that first one, he was still, I think we can still go through to the 1960s. So 40 odd years, almost constantly, there were Harry Dolman inventions um, that were patented. Um, quite extraordinary. And some of those, give me some examples of some of the things Harry invented. Um, 
it's really I think he was really the start of these coin operated vending machines. Um, on the right is H. Evans in Hotwell Road in Bristol. Um, he, he invented the method of how people could buy cigarettes without having to go into um, a tobacconist, for example, to physically buy them. So he would come up with how all of the mechanics would work when somebody put in some money, how the coin would drop down uh, behind the, the facade of the front of the machine, how change would be um, expended. So the coins were, there was a weighing mechanism uh, and that weighing me mechanism would work out when you put your six sixpence in or, your, or your, your, any other coinage that the machine could take, um, how that would then translate to change coming out. And it revolutionized really the way some of the shopkeepers operated because I think some uh, tobacconists at the time were were a cock a hoop really because they they were in bed and when when people were coming out of the pubs late at night and they wanted a cigarette they could actually um, get some sales um, in in the in the in the late or early mornings if you like so Harry was very much behind these sorts of machines um, and with his when he was with um, uh, the company. Um, Harry actually rose from in the 1920s from a, an apprentice um, to a director of Bretnell, Munro and, and Rogers. Um, and he attended the International uh, Expo in Barcelona in 1929. And his vending machine inventions won a gold medal for the company and really put the, the business on the map, not only nationally, but internationally. Um, and Harry, Harry certainly spoke his mind as well because there was um one one example he gave in his, in his notes about um when he was an apprentice fairly new to the company um they supplied wd and ho wheels in their factories tobacco factories in bedminster and uh mardens the packaging company uh, in Redcliffe street in bristol they supplied um machines for those businesses and one machine, a new machine, had recently gone into Wills, and and Harry looked at it again back in the in the office or back in the factory, and and thought, well, this could be a lot more efficient than what we've actually just sent out, and so he put those ideas to his directors, and they they weren't having anything of it. No, no, we we sold this kit to Wills. They're happy with it. That's it. We're, away we go. Behind the back of the Brett Norman Munro and Rogers directors, Harry went to Wills and said, if you did these modifications, it would be operate even more effectively. Of course, what Harry didn't realize was that the, you know, the chairman and directors of Wills were quite friendly with the chairman and directors of BMR. So um, a word in their ear soon alerted them to what, what Harry was up to. So he was um, called in front of the directors of Brett Norman Munro and Rogers gave him a right old telling off, said, you just don't do that sort of thing. And uh, he was sacked. Um, however, I think within a week or two, they actually realized that they had a real gem in Harry Dolman. Um, so they called him back in to the boardroom, gave him another ticking off, told him not to do that again, but you can have your job back. So um, that's quite an interesting sort of take on what Harry, Harry was like. And, and if he thought something was wrong and needed to be put right, then he stuck to his guns, really. Sticking to his guns, well, interestingly, I think Harry Harry really regretted not flying for the RAF in, in the First World War. And he was delighted when this French chap called Henri Minier um, manufactured and produced, or came up with the designs for a one person um, flying machine, a small individual plane. Um, Henri Minier flied from France to fields around Dover to prove to people that this was a, a safe um, plane. And he nicknamed it his, his flying flea. And on the left there, you see um, sort of artist impression of how people, anybody who had a, just a little bit of money, uh, could put together a wooden framed plane with a very small outboard engine at the front and a propeller um, and Harry saw this and thought brilliant I can actually buy one of these 
make it and fly it. And that is what Harry attempted to do. Um, Harry built his flying flea um, both at home and at the factory Bretnell Munro and Rogers in 1935-1936, that sort of time. And he called his flying flea the Blue Finch. And on the left there, you can see an image of Harry's flying flea under construction um, at his company's office uh, factory. Um, and on the right is one of the, the wing frames being being constructed as well. And in, in doing this uh, research, I had, I had a, some lovely chats with Tony Dolman, who's Harry's um, Harry's son. And um, Harry, uh, sorry, Tony lives still lives in the house at Staple Hill, Hill, where Harry lived with his wife Doris. And Tony can recall how, as a young family, seeing um, seeing his father building parts of um, the, the the blue finch. In the front guard, in the front room, but made it in such a way he couldn't get it out of the house. And the only way they could do it is actually go through, break out the window of the lounge and take these uh, big wing frames out through the house. So um, that's a nice, nice story from from, uh, from Tony. So where could Harry fly his um, his flying flea? Well, at, at Witchurch Airport. And it's a lovely photograph of Harry there, smiling in the cockpit of his uh, of his flying flea in uh, 1936 um, on one of the grass runways at, uh, at Whitchurch Airport, as was uh, in Bristol, which is Hengrove Way, now where I think the uh, the Hengrove Hospital, roughly in that area. But it wasn't hugely successful because um, we don't actually think, or Marina doesn't think, that Harry actually got off the ground, or at least if he did, it wasn't very high, because he kept on flipping his uh, blue finch plane and here's an image of uh, Harry uh, hands on hips just after he flipped his um, plane uh, at Whitchurch Airport and the manager of the airport was so concerned about safety of Harry and other flying flea um, pilots that they were banned uh, they were barred from Whitchurch Airport so Harry took it to Hullavington near Chippenham and carried on trying to get the flying flea off the ground but kept on breaking it, or kept on flipping it, sorry, and kept on breaking the propellers. So every time he flipped his flying flea, he seemed to break the oak propellers. And um, we came across one of those propellers at Marina's house during this, uh, during the research for the book. Now, after the Civil Aviation Authority, they actually banned the craft um, because probably about a dozen people were killed um, flying this plane, um, a few in, 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 the, in the UK, including one or two um, former RAF aces from the, uh, from the First World War. Um, and so the Civil Aviation Authority put the flying three through, put the, the, the plane through wind tunnel tests and so forth. And it seems though there's a real fundamental design fault that when the plane went into a bit of a dive, the pilots were just unable to recover that and it so they plunged into the ground. Um, so the flying flea was banned only three or four years after um, it first entered Brit Britain's airspace and so Harry donated the flying flea to the Science Museum in 1937-1938 and when MSHA was open the Science Museum in turn put it, gave it to the MSHA Museum on permanent loan uh, in 2011. So if you go to the MSHA Museum, it's likely to open at the end of May. Uh, you will be able to see the flying flea in the roof. And it was Marina and I were standing talking um, under the flying flea when we had our conversation about Harry. So that's, uh, that's how the book came about and the story of the flying flea emerged. Well, once he got the flying flea out of his uh, system, um, Harry continued working for the for his engineering company, but he actually became a director of Bristol City Football Club in 1939. Um, but still, actually played football for the for the company team. And then you can see lovely shot of Harry holding the football in, in the middle uh, of of, um, of that team picture. Um, and during World War Two, um, 
Brecknell, Munro and Rogers were awarded several military contact contracts and um, Harry's co-director actually was seconded to work in the war office on procurement um, during World War Two. So the company was pretty much run by Harry during the Second World War period. And on the left, um, you've got his colleagues and Harry is bottom right, just peering, uh, peering at the camera with his um, uh, a military cap on. This is a tank that the 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 apprentices and the workers in the factory were were taking apart. Um, and Harry formed uh, the company's first home guard unit. So there's Harry on the far right with one of his colleagues, uh, employee colleagues in, in the home guard. <clears throat> at Harry's invitation, uh, Queen Mary was living at Babington House during the Second World War period and often made visits to local companies. Uh, Harry actually wrote to her and said, why don't you come and see what we're doing um, in, in Bretnall, Monroe and Rogers? And sure enough, she did. And so a couple of photographs, the one on the right um, is relatively well known. The one on the left uh, was in um, Harry's own private collection that Marina showed us. Um, so, yeah, there's Harry um, giving the Queen a tour, a tour of the factory. Um, and as I mentioned, Harry was the only director employed by BMR during uh, the Second World War. <clears throat> and he kind of showed his sort of um, management skills, really, and empathy for, for people and employees, because he introduced during the Second World War an incentive scheme for all thousand employees. Um, and uh, I guess the, the, you'd say the, 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 the factory is run on fairly paternalistic lines, but they're in talking to um, there's still a, um, a staff association, even though the company is long gone now, a staff association who really fondly remember that that period of when Harry was in charge because it was um, yeah a, a fun place to be is what people said and um, they had a lot of respect for the way Harry managed people. Very strong believer in promoting uh, staff from within. But moving back to some of his football designs, he he designed and introduced the very first floodlights at Ashton Gate Stadium. And this is um, the Bristol City Ground um, in the uh, late 1940s. <clears throat> and you see the floodlights, you probably see the one on the left slightly better than the one on the right, but here, here were the first floodlights. In fact, Bristol City hosted the first ever floodlit game of football of professional football clubs in, in, in the UK um, when Bristol City took on Wolves. And the season after, floodlights, floodlights became more common. Um, and it was still some time before there were league games, but friendly matches at night were a real novelty in those days. Um, in 1949, he became um, chairman of Bristol City Football Club. And I should say that he also designed the first ever turnstiles at um, Bristol Rovers old ground at, at uh, Eastville Stadium. So 1949, he's now chairman of Bristol City Football Club. <clears throat> he's signed a Wiltshire farmer's um, son called John Attio, one of Bristol City's best ever signings, I think. Um, and this was typical of Harry. He actually met John Attio's father, had a cup of tea or probably a pint with him um, and persuaded John Attio that he should join Bristol City and not go to people like Arsenal and Liverpool, and other big clubs who were who were keen to get hold of John Attio's signature. <clears throat> um, during, during my research, I was really, really pleased when I spoke to Tony, Tony Dolman and met him in, in his house in Staple Hill in Bristol. Tony uh, provided some photographs and some documents, and he also presented me with um, two vinyl recordings, his big um, 33 RPM vinyl recordings from a company that used to be in uh, Park Row in Bristol, a sound, a sound recording company. <clears throat> um, and Tony thought they were um, boring AGM recordings of Bretnell, Munro and Rogers. Uh, well, they weren't. Um, and so what I'd like to do now is play, play you the recording. And it's basically recording of the end of Bristol City's 
uh, 54-55 season uh, when they won promotion. So this is a recording of um, news broadcasters or re sports reporters of the day. Um, this is before the BBC really came into existence. Um, so these were transmitted on, but they would have been on the, um, if you like, the embryo uh, BBC, but they were um, amazing recordings and, and Tony didn't know what was on them. And uh, I, I brought them home. I managed to digitize them on a bit of kit I've got and I'll play them for you now. Um, it's about 11 minutes long, but it's just this lovely account of that season. And you can hear Harry's voice and hear his philosophy. And as the recording is played, rather than just hear audio and nothing else, um, we should see rotating images every 10, 15 seconds or so. And I'll try to switch off the audio at the end. It might suddenly go into repeat, in which case I'll quickly come out of the talk and then go back in. So I hope you enjoy what you're about to, to hear. So make sure you've got your, uh, your audio turned on. When the red, red robin comes ba ba bobbing along, along, there'll be no more sobbing when he stops robbing his old sweet song. And if you've ever been to Ashton Gate in Bristol, you'll know that is the signature tune of Bristol City, the Robins, who this season have gone bobbing along right into the second division of the English Football League, champions of the third division South for the first time since they were relegated in 1932. <laughs> Yes, singing, let's be polite about it, in their mouth. And the players have certainly got something to sing about. We'll come back to them in a moment. But first, how did they do it? Well, so many records have gone by the board this promotion season. To keep pace, you've got to be a statistician, a memory man, and a sporting library all rolled into one. To win promotion by nine points makes the whole thing look, well, so easy that one's apt to forget those dark days in December and again in January when promotion seemed to be slipping away. It was really two brilliant spurts that did the trick. Those first 13 games without defeat, a grand solid foundation. And then to finish the season with a run of 18 games without losing one, well, that sent the records flying. Well, let's uh, sweep up a few of the smash pieces, put them together and see how they add up. Those 30 victories mean Bristol City won more games than any other side in the whole four divisions. When you remember Chelsea gained the Football League Championship with 10 fewer victories, well, those 30 certainly look a mighty effort. Well, goals bring victory. There again, Bristol City made their mark. More than 100 scored, and only Blackburn could do better. But then even Blackburn, along with every other club in the country, had to bow to Bristol City's goal average. Only 47 conceded. That means Bristol alone had more than two to one in their favor. All this brings along another record the club with the fewest defeats. Beaten only six times in their 46 matches, and that's 50% better than the next best. So much for the statistics. How were they achieved? Well, I think the whole story of promotion hangs on two inspired positional moves. After three successive defeats in January, Tommy Burden was moved from half-back to inside forward. The city didn't lose another game. And secondly, the switch of Jimmy Rogers from wing to centre forward. Yes, two inspired strokes from right behind the scenes. And the man behind the scenes, the manager, Pat Beasley. And I said when I came, well, give me five years and we'll try to do something. Well, now our ambition is, is realized and naturally everybody is very happy and very proud. No one more so than myself. No, I shouldn't think so. What do you think has been the, uh, the main reason for the team's success this year? Well, we've had a marvelous team spirit here and... Uh, We've gone not out as one man, but as a team. We've got no um, personalities or individuals. We've got 11 players going out on the field playing for 90 minutes, and that's where our success has been obtained. Yes, team spirit. That's what they all say. The captain, Jackie White, for one. It's a great feeling. The boys have fought hard all the season, and, well, we're probably top this time. After two years of near things, sort of thing. What do you think has been the main reason for your success? Well, teamwork. Real hard work, and, and all pulling together and fighting for each other. You had some, had some fairly harrowing moments, though, throughout the season. Yes, well, we had Leighton with us all the time, and up, up till the end of February, and since then we've pulled away. Were you ever afraid you weren't going to do it? No, no, I was pretty confident, but it, 
Oh, sort of you beginning of the forecast? Yes, yes. Uh, back in January, beginning of January, I said the team that finished at the, that were at the top by the end of February would finish at the top at the end of the season. And how do you feel about second division football next season? Well, I don't think we've much to worry about. From the opposition I've seen out at the Rovers ground this year, the away form doesn't seem too great, so we've got a very good chance. And the new boy at the side, Arthur Milton. But I'd like to endorse Jack's statement. He said that uh, it was a team win, and uh, I fully agree on those lines. And I must say, he was always confident when, when even things didn't look too good. But even when you're confident, you can't always stop worrying. Yes, I, I happen to be working at a big shoe factory outside of Bristol, and uh, during the day I'm apt to be thinking about what we're going to do on the Saturday, but uh, it's all over now, and I'm glad it's ended as it has. You haven't lost any sleep. Well, nearly. <laughs> well, Tommy Burton didn't lose any sleep, but John Atio wasn't so lucky. Well, I'm afraid I got in such a state towards the end I couldn't sleep or eat or hardly anything. But it didn't show in your play, anyway. Oh, it came out all right in the end, didn't it? Yes, it came out all right in the end. But the players weren't the only ones who had their doubts. Well, frankly, though they were the better side and won by two clear goals, it can't be said that this rather scrambling game showed Bristol City up in a very good light. And I think every City supporter will agree with me. If the Bristol team had produced anything like the form that swept them to the top of the league a few months back, they would have romped home with a pile of goals. The opposition was so very, very weak, and for nearly the whole of the second half, Coventry played with ten men. In fact, there was one 15-minute spell when they had only nine men on the field. Yet, in spite of young Jimmy Rogers' forceful work at centre forward, the Bristol attack was sluggish, uncertain, and at times quite ineffective. No, unless there is a rapid improvement, Bristol haven't a chance of overtaking Leighton. Let's hope it comes before it's too late. Jim Brady in Sport in the West in January. But three months later... Oh, what a wondrous victory this was, and never one so well deserved. Because it was evident quite early that Northampton were eager to succeed where opposing teams in the city's last six games have failed. Today, there is nothing to stop the Bristol side. I've never seen them in better form. Every man jack of them. Hard as they played, Northampton just could do nothing with them. Always, always, the eager city forwards were on the attack. Always, always, Northampton's counters were stopped long before they got dangerous. Bristol's defence was near perfect. Well, City won by five goals to one, but Northampton gave them a tough game. Today, they were completely outclassed by a City team which on this form, and late Orient permitting, should romp into the second division. Well, I suppose it was the same team, Jim. What have you got to say for yourself now? Well, uh, at times, of course, like everybody else, I, I didn't think they'd make it. Uh, they seemed to lack punch, they were inconsistent, they lost spirit. Uh, but, of course, I think, as other people, e Easter was the turning point. Now, of the players, well, with all due respect to Burden and Arthur Milton, I think Jimmy Rogers contributed as much as anybody to the city's success. The lad's enthusiasm and vigour inspired the others, well, and his face got the goals. Uh, the most improved player of the game, well, I think Thresher. That's the reporter's story. We've already heard the manager and the players, but how did the chairman take his triumph? This, ladies and gentlemen, is the happiest day of my life. Last week, when I heard we won promotion, I nearly cried with joy. And that was Mr. Harry Dolman down at Ashton Gate on Champagne Day. But a success story like this isn't all cheers and champagne. The story began in the boardroom six years ago when Mr. Dolman and his fellow directors drew up a plan to improve the ground and, more important, to build a promotion team. And for that, of course, they needed money. Well, in one way and another, they found it. The directors, for example, had between them put up 15,000 pounds. And who are these men, the directors? Well, they're mostly businessmen, of course. But um, I believe we're the only club in the country with a person on the board. Uh, oh, they're a good lot of sports. Uh, one or two uh, are really characters in themselves because, uh, for instance, one <clears throat> would make a good broadcasting commentator. Mm. He talks about the match from the beginning to the end, and uh, I'm sure I've never heard anyone uh, describe the various actions of the players better than he does. Not even not around the terraces? <laughs> not around the terraces. Do you think they'd have been prepared to go on putting money into the club if you'd failed this time? Well, I suppose there's a limit to everything. <clears throat> I can't imagine they'd go on indefinitely doing it. Anyhow, they've been pretty good. They've done it for five years.
and they've done it at a time when many clubs, not only in the third division, are losing money faster than they care to think about. But don't get the idea that this is a rich club. Oh no, I would say we're anything but rich. But I think uh, we are potentially wealthy. Mm -hmm. Would you say there's a chance then that the directors are going to get this money back? Well, as chairman of the club, I think it's my duty to see they get it back. And as quickly as possible. And is this promotion going to be the answer? Is this going to make a great financial difference? This is going to make a lot of difference to us. Uh, I think, uh, I feel pretty confident that our gates next year uh, will be in the region of 25,000 uh, average. Is that going to be enough to offset the greater expenses you're going to have in the second division? You've got further to travel, for instance, haven't you? Well, we have, uh, we've lived fairly comfortably on 16 to 17,000 gates. Okay. Now, if we can get 25,000 gates, uh, that's going to be at least another 800 a week, 800 pounds a week. And that's gross, of course, and that is rather a lot of money. Mm -hmm. How much do you think it's cost you altogether? You mean me personally? Or no, no, the, or club. the club. I should say the club have spent 40,000 pounds on the ground for the stand and put in the ground in condition. Mm -hmm. And I should think we've spent somewhere near the same for players. But we have got quite a bit of the money back that we spent for players. Why is this um, such a sought-after prize, this promotion, Mr. Dolman? Is it um, just good business? No, I think it's good fun. Um, football is a business, but uh, from my point of view, it's good fun. And... Uh, I just love it. And so, for the first time, Bristol will have two clubs in the second division. Bristol Rovers, remember, were promoted two years ago. Now, this is, of course, the city's program, but there is time for John Gummo, the Rovers secretary, to say something about their old rivals. Well, obviously, first of all, we would hasten to congratulate Bristol City on a very fine achievement. Um, I think that it will prove to be a great stimulus to the soccer follower in Bristol and in the West Country. Um, for instance, the second division has many star, many star players. And it may well be that when perhaps, say, Sheffield Wednesday um, visit Ashton Gate on a Tuesday evening at the beginning of next season, that the city supporter who goes to Ashton Gate and, and sees Sheffield Wednesday and, and, and likes what he sees, he, he um, sees Finney and Quicksall and such stars as that for the very first time, then it may very well be that when the Rovers play Sheffield Wednesday later in the year at Eastville, that he'll come along to Eastville and, uh, and uh, then see how the Rovers get on uh, against the same side. Um, I think that the city promotion can do nothing but good for Bristol football in general. And we've left the last word to the Lord Mayor of Bristol, Alderman Gilbert Adams. Back then to that exciting moment two Saturdays ago when the championship shield was presented. Mr. Dolan, ladies and gentlemen, this is a great occasion. On behalf of the citizens of Bristol, I congratulate Bristol City upon a well-earned promotion. promotion with a good margin. But next year, we want to see them win promotion to the first division. Well, I hope you liked, uh, enjoyed that run through of a, a, a mid 1950s uh, recording. We think that's 70, 70 years ago. Um, it's quite extraordinary, really, to, to hear thoughts and aspirations uh, and, and reports from that period. Um, and of course, yeah, when we come across that from a yeah, researching a book point of view or somebody's life, that was um, that was priceless. And of course, when I told Tony Dolman, it wasn't a boring AGM of his father's company. It was, in fact, a, a broadcast recording of, of the period. Uh, he was absolutely, absolutely delighted.
Um, okay. <clears throat> With um, Bristol City now on a bit of a roll, um, from a football point of view, um, Harry settled into life as, um, as chair, not only chairman of, of the club, but he became a, a director of um, Bretnell, Dolman uh, and Rogers. And again, throughout the 1950s and 1960s, the company, pretty much under his stewardship, um, saw rapid, rapid growth. And they did all sorts of things in, in their factory sites, packing and wrapping machines. We've already talked about how, how good um, Harry was at in, inventing machinery. Um, well, he carried on with, with that and he, he introduced the first um, ticket machines to the London Underground, for example, uh, luggage lockers and all of these um, different company products were, were displayed on in those days, flyers, posters, and uh, sent to various um, potential stockists all, all, all over the world. Um, stamp machines, you know, the, the, the stamp machines we used to see outside post offices, that was, was Harry's, Harry's invention. Um, he came up with the first ever automatic uh, roulette table um, that was on show at Ashton Court Country Club in Bristol. And the image here is of an egg, egg grading machine that Harry invented. So uh, the whole packing of eggs in factories, the machines to grade different eggs in, in, in their sizes, all of the technology around those machines was yet another Harry Dolman uh, in, invention. Um, this was the image from the Royal Show at uh, Whitchurch on, on the airport site. Um, showing some of those products on, on the image on the left from the cigarette machines, um, the chocolate vending machines, Cadbury's, Fry's, you name it, um, anything to do with a coin operated vending machine, copyright Bretnell, Dolman and Rogers um, with no doubt huge sums of, of patent money and, and copyright money coming into the company. Um, and the big machine in the foreground there is the first ever food vending machine um, that, again, Harry, Harry invented the technology for that particular machine. Um, his and the company's expertise really was recognised by having the, um, uh, the Queen's Award uh, to industry, um, getting that accolade. Um, and Marina's got a lovely certificate that she still holds. Um, that was presented to Harry by, by, the, by the Queen. Um, and here she is looking at some of the machines on show at uh, one of the trade fairs that Bretnell, uh, Dolman and Rogers used to attend. And there's HRH uh, with, with Harry Dolman on, the, on both of those photographs. Um, Marina Crossley <coughs> uh, joined Bretnell, Dolman and Rogers in 1959 as Harry's secretary. So there's Marina um, Crossley, as she was on the far left, uh, pouring, pouring Harry a martini at one of the, um, the, the famous Christmas do's that the company used to hold. Um, Harry, Harry and his wife, Doris, had effectively left, lived separate lives for about 15 years in their house at Staple Hill. They pretty much split the house up into two. Even though they lived under the same roof, they were effectively... Uh, separate um, individuals, really. Um, Marina's story about how she um, got to meet Harry for the first time is quite interesting because M Marina was on the um, one of the first Bristol Hanover School exchanges. Um, I think it was in 1953, 54, something like that. Um, and this is when Marina was at Merrywood Girls School in Knoll in Bristol. And um, she really loved it over in Hanover. And one of her pen pals that she struck up a friendship with after that um, wrote to Marina to say that she herself had become, uh, she was expecting her first child and could, could Marina step in for her during her maternity leave? So Marina went across to, to Hanover and worked in a, um, a tire manufacturing company in, in Hanover. Um, it wasn't necessarily what she wanted, but she really did enjoy the life of living in Germany and spending some time with her pen pal. 
and covering her job for her for a while. Marina's mother wrote to her when she was there, and Marina really wanted to be a, an air hostess. That was what she really wanted to do. But Marina's mum dropped her a line to say, I'm not sure how long you're going to be over in Hanover, but actually there's a, a great job that's come up as the PA to the managing director of Bretnell, Dolman and Rogers, a chap called Harry Dolman. So with some regret, um, Marina left Hanover and came over to Easton and was interviewed by um, Harry and one of his colleagues and actually um, got the job, which Marina was a little bit disappointed at, but felt she couldn't do anything else other than accept it. Harry and Marina got on like nobody's business. They really enjoyed each other's company. And a few years later, um, Marina and Harry got married and uh, Marina stood down as her PA job and, and Harry carried on um, as head of the company. Um, but Marina accompanied Harry on all, all of his business trips. You can see them here at, on the um, just getting up to a Cambrian Airlines uh, plane, uh, which was actually going to Dublin on a on a, um, a convention, an engineering convention. Um, and she also, Harry and Marina, loved going across the United States. So um, on business trips, Harry and Marina would fly across one way and come back on the um, uh, the Queen Elizabeth ship on the other. And there you can see them on board the ship in the bottom right hand, hand corner. Going through um, uh, Marina's co collection of what Harry Dolman had in his collection, there's a fantastic photograph album um, of operations at the factory at Bretnell, Dolman and Rogers. And in the front of it, this was a photograph album that Harry had put together himself. And this was the opening um, phrases really of that book and just uh, explains really his management style really. Uh, the object of this book is to keep alive in years to come, the memory of those who helped to raise the prestige and standing of Bren Bretnell Munro and Rogers Limited. The junior of today may be the managing director of tomorrow. The men who try to do something and fail are definitely better than those who try to do nothing and succeed. I think um, that's a lovely, I lo really love that last, uh, that last sentence. Um, and that really sums Harry up uh, to a T to a really. Um, he'd support anyone who was keen to get on, um, but he didn't have any time for uh, for shirkers. Just a few images from uh, from that album um, that he kept uh, pulling the pints at the um, the factory bar, playing skittles with his colleagues, always, always attended uh, the leaving dues of retiring employees and made presentations to them. And with his fun uh, side to him, um, he and the directors and their other and their partners would always dress up for the Bretnell, Munro and uh, Dolman and Rogers, um, the Christmas pantomime, uh, etc. Um, and on the left, you can see Harry playing Father Christmas uh, for all the employees of factory workers who came to the, the Christmas children's party. And on the right, an onerous task of Harry presenting the prizes at the, um, the Miss Bretnell, Dolman and Rogers um, uh, charity uh, event. Uh, the cup, I'm not sure who won it, but it uh, looks like, yeah, probably the, the lady to Harry's uh, left shoulder. So just give you an idea of, of the things that really drove Harry. Meanwhile, back at BS3, the Ashton Gate area of, of Bristol, 10 years on from the recording we heard and um, Bristol City, got another promotion back to Division 2 from from whence they came. Uh, so this was a, a team photograph on the left um, from that from that uh, from that squad. And on the right, um, they had a dinner and dance at Ashton Court Country Club uh, and another uh, piece of ephemera found in, in Marina's uh, collection. Now, moving the story on another 10 years or so, um, well, to 1967, sorry. Um, probably Bristol City's most successful manager was this chap, Alan Dix, on the left. And you can see Harry Dorman uh, welcoming, uh, welcoming Alan to Bristol City Football Club in, uh, in October 1967. And Alan was actually um, welcomed to 
Bristol City by a, a little nine-year-old upstart. Well, and that was me because um, today uh, I found, I knew I had it somewhere, but I actually found it buried in a, a folder in the loft. Um, on the left is Alan Dix's reply to me after I, I had welcomed him uh, to uh, Bristol City in 1967. Um, and unbelievably, I found this little photograph as well. And this is me as a 13 year old um, at Temple Mead Station in one of those photo booths on my way to my first ever away game as a Bristol City supporter, just as a 13 year old. I got the train to Swindon, saw City and came back with one of my schoolmates. Um, can't quite believe that my parents allowed me to do that on my own. The bus, the bus from Bishopsworth down to Temple Meads, up to Swindon and back after the match. Uh, and City won 1-0, by the way. So later on, after Anna Dix was appointed, um, Harry persuaded the board of Bristol City, uh, the directors, um, to back his plans for a brand new stand. Now, Harry was really ahead of his time because he he really realised that the football club, in terms of space, took up a lot of space and you only really generated income every home match. And so that could be two weeks away when the ground was actually doing nothing, wasn't generating any revenue. Um, so his idea was that if we had a stand big enough to get more crowd into the into a match. We could also use the undercroft, the space under the stadium for other things um, like a bar area or in what Harry was wanted to do, uh, open up the area for in, um, inside bowls. So um, a bowls club actually, um, he was in discussions with a bowls club. So he was, I think, ahead of his time in terms of how to stretch the assets of a, of a football club. And here we see him in 1970, uh, not long before um, the stand, um, which was to bear his name, the Dolman Stand. And the Dolman Stand is still in the same position at Ashton Gate Stadium today. Um, but this was this was his vision, really, um, his vision to get this stand and to to uh, to put his footprint absolutely on on Bristol City Football Club. And not long after this photograph was taken, he actually stood down as a, a, a managing director of Bretnell, Dolman and Rogers when they were taken over. Um, in, in, it wasn't an aggressive takeover, but I think the company that took Bretnell, Dolman and Rogers over um, paid a very healthy premium to the share price. And it was one of those occasions when uh, I think the directors couldn't really do anything else other than accept the offer. Um, However, troubles emerged on the Bristol City board, um, as they do on all football club boards over time. Um, so Harry stepped down as chairman of Bristol City in 1974, but actually stayed on as the club's first ever president. And he was there at Ashton Gate in 1976, uh, when Bristol City beat um, Portsmouth 1-0. Um, to actually be promoted to the old Division One, the Premiership of, of today. So um, Harry had actually seen his dream come true, really. Um, the press, the media were, were full of the, the story. Um, 37 years as a, a director and chairman and president of Bristol City Football Club. Um, and now on the left with Alan Dick celebrating uh, the big night in uh, end of the 1976 season when City got that uh, hallowed uh, promotion. Um, a few years later, Harry, um, or a couple, just a year later actually, he, he celebrated his 80th birthday with some of those um, icons from Bristol City Football Club, Arthur Milton on the left, John Attio, and ooh, Mike Adams, Don Rogers, no, no, Don Clark. Um, yeah, I think that's Don Clark. Um, Mike will put me right if I'm wrong there. Um, and unfortunately, only three months after that photograph, Harry, Harry, Harry passed away. Um, but before the Bristol City game in 1976, when um, Bristol City got promotion, um, the Bristol Evening Post produced this lovely image of Marina Dolman and Harry in their house in the uh, Chew Magna. Um, so celebrating his life with the city and really fingers crossed on what was going to happen later that evening. And of course, it uh, 
course it did. Um, and that kind of brings me round to kind of some concluding um, slides, really. Um, the book that Marina Abdomen asked me and my colleague Martin on the left there to write um, was produced uh, and launched at Ashton Gate Stadium in November 2017. Um, and all of the sales for the first edition of that book uh, went to the benefit of the Bristol City uh, Foundation or, or, or Bristol City Community Trust. And uh, £8,000 was raised uh, for that trust from sales of the, uh, of, of the first edition. And what I really enjoyed about researching Harry's story and talking to lots of family um, and acquaintances and relatives was, was really meeting Tony. Tony's a lovely chap, he used to be a head teacher, I think, of Parsons Street Primary School uh, in Bristol. Uh, there he is with his uh, grandchildren, just showing them some of the items we uncovered, uh, uncovered during the research, um, including, you see the vinyl records there, uh, Harry's traditional uh, hat, <clears throat> A propeller from the a flying flea, which is now donated to the um, uh, Air, uh, Aircraft Museum at Filton, and a lovely trunk containing lots and lots of um, ephemera photographs and cards that Marina had kept. And one of the pluses and benefits for me is that Marina Blesser has now um, deposited Harry's collection into Bristol Archives, and that was done in July 2018. So she there's only one photograph album which is yet to donate, but everything else we came across in our research in Marina's house has now come across as an archive. Um, and as a bit of a treat for Marina, I got one of the archivists, Malcolm, to show Marina around some of the strong rooms upstairs. And on the left, you can see Marina looking at the Merrywood Girls School register from the early 1950s. And she's just picked out her name in the register. And on, on the right there, Malcolm is showing Marina um, lovely building plans of Ashton Gate Stadium in early 1900s and plans for what was the old grandstand, um, which is now the brand new Lansdowne stand. But um, so, yeah, Ma Marina was fascinated to see all of those plans and to know that her, uh, her collection of Harry Dolman material would be really well looked after. Uh, for generations to come. That's about it from me. Thank you very much uh, for listening. And if uh, I haven't mentioned the book before, um, if, you, if you do want to get hold of a copy, uh, you can get it from um, our Bristol Books uh, website, www.bristolbooks.org. I'll shut up now and I'll hand you back to um, Andrew. And um, if there are any questions, I'd be very happy to, uh, to answer them. Thank you very much. Clive, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, let's uh, get to all our people. That was very fascinating. and certainly something I knew nothing about. <laughs> well, hopefully um, it wasn't too footly. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Very good. Um, right. Anybody who's interested and got any questions for Clive, um, please unmute yourselves. I think if you hit your space bar, you will unmute. And... Uh, by all means, chip in and, uh, and ask him any questions. No, uh, Mike, I can see you lurking in the background there. Hi, Colin. <laughs> Hi. I just want to know, Clive, if you, uh, I'm sure you were aware in your research of the, the work Harry Dolan did on mechanization of the turnstiles at Ashton Gate uh, in my, in the early fifties, in my days as a, as a student apprentice, I worked on a, a system we in, installed, which was um, a, a switch on every turnstile, mm -hmm. which relayed a signal to the boardroom. Um, and I, on the boardroom wall, there was this huge mechanical <laughs> contraption framed in mahogany or rosewood or something very very beautiful but it's registered every number of every person who went through a turnstile and then mechanically i believe it was i'm sure it was mechanically in those days at 50 in the 50s mechanically it worked out if somebody had gone through a, a senior's turnstile and, and the charge was two and sixpence 
as it added up, the numbers rolled up on this on this board in the boardroom. And so he could see as the numbers came in exactly how much money he should be getting from each turnstile. And that, he introduced that because uh, the turnstile operators, I understand, were diddling him in, the, in the, if you, I don't, I suppose we're <laughs> too, too young to remember this, but you used to be able to go in and put a shilling on the on the turnstile counter and the turnstile operator would then press his pedal and he could walk through the turnstile. He wouldn't necessarily take the right amount of money. So I think Harry Dolman was a bit concerned about the amount of money with the, the club were losing through that sort of thing. Of course, he, what he didn't do was um, the, the, the me mechanization of all this didn't take an account of the turnstile operator letting anybody jump over the top of the turnstile to get in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant, Colin. I, no, I wasn't aware of that, but I'm I'm not at all surprised because he was a very, very shrewd business, yeah, businessman, yeah. wasn't he? It was it was a beautiful piece of equipment up on the board and wall. Absolutely immense it was, you can imagine. Every turnstile coming back, wow. each individual turnstile coming back and, and each one turning over at counters on on a on a on, on this on this indicator board. <laughs> And then adding it all up, and so you could see then how many thousands I should have this week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and the other thing about the other thing about working there was on the those early floodlights which Harry designed. Uh, I can remember we had to put a, a new electrical supply in, totally new electrical supply in to to, to uh, power them because they were they were 500 watt and 300 watt tungsten bulbs in what we called shovel floods in those days. Wow. on tripods which hinge down alongside the, the uh, bitch. Uh, so you can imagine the absolutely immense load and then the, the, the lighting was was abysmal really. It was, uh, you couldn't actually, you couldn't actually see in the middle, you could see in the middle of the pitch, but it was certainly <laughs> was, well, it wasn't, it was certainly not good enough for television. <laughs> oh, thank you, Colin. That's really fascinating. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Any more? Can I ask you, Clive? Um, it's Jackie here. Did he have any invention? I know the plane didn't succeed in the end, but were there other things which just didn't work out the way he'd hoped? I'm not, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure, Jackie. There was one. Um, I, I don't think his first invention worked out as well as he wanted it to, from what what he was saying. But that that certainly didn't dissuade him. He was one of these sorts of people who who would try and try again to, to he, he actually got to the right um, right right result. Mm -hmm. He was um, I think there was a lovely exchange with he was trying to curry the favour of a maid who worked on the farm at Chippenham, and to to do that he had to work out how to fix a pedal on her bicycle, and so that was his real incentive to work out that because that then hit that might might have uh, progressed his relationship with the maid. And so he he, he, really, <laughs> he really did have this sort of um, amazing desire to get things right. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's quite amazing how that kind of comes through in everything he did in every part of his life. Yeah. It wasn't just that inventing things. It was just, um, and yeah, a bit like that, that turnstile example, really. If, if he thought somebody was fiddling, well, how can I... What, what technology can I em, em, employ to stop them doing that? It's a bit like the coin machines as well, because people would would try to put in um, similar weighted foreign mm. coins. Um, so he was trying to work out how to combat that as well. So he, it was brilliant. So I'm not aware of any specific example where he he, he failed to produce something. He, he and I think Marina made sure said, that it was successful. Yeah, yeah. And Marina was saying even when he he'd retired, the things he was making at um, their house in Chew Magna. Um, he was still busily inventing things to make their life easier around the house and in the garden. Mm. And she would despair sometimes. He'd be out in his workshop fiddling, doing something else. So he was just consumed by this, this need to develop and grow all the time, which is, is a fantastic trait to have, really. Mm. Well, thank you so much for bringing it all to life. It was a fascinating, well, he's a fascinating man, but it was fascinating yeah. talk. So thank yeah. you very much. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Clive, do you know if they lived at um, Porter's Head at some time? Harry Sorry? And, did, did Harry and Marina live at Porter's Head at some time? Uh, no, they didn't, no. Colin. When they, when they left, um, well, when Har Harry 
when Harry passed away, Marina was still living in, in Chumagna. Um, and then she moved from Chumagna to East, Easter Compton. And so she's, uh, she's living in a, a farmhouse building now with, with her sister, Easter Compton. Uh -huh. So be. I don't think I don't think they no. lived in Portishead. It could be uh, yeah, Easter Compton. It could be them. Yeah. I was thinking. I, know Bobby, I think Bobby Gould lived in Portishead. I think and uh, right the Gould it's family. That your your mention of the the Bristol Hanover um, connection. In our early married time, we we used to have students from Hanover, and we'd gone to, to Hanover on mm. a, on exchange. And there was one of them who always, whenever she came to stay with us, she always went to visit Marina. I know she went to visit, always had to go and visit Marina. Now why or how, I can't remember what connection was, but she she always had to go to, to, to visit Marina. It was one of her duties when she came to Bristol. What sort of year was that, uh, Colin? <sighs> um, uh, 60s, early okay. 60s. Well, well, I know Marie, Marina became president of the Bristol Hanover Exchange and yeah. um, Marina's always kept in touch with that pen girl I mentioned in my talk yeah. and they're still in touch now even though they're you know they're well into their sort of mid 80s and um, as we are yeah, as we, yeah. Um, <laughs> which is not, not a problem of course but, um, <laughs> uh, but, but, but Marina's kept all of her photographs and, and correspondence oh. with this uh, other woman and it's yeah. a really big Big folder now, yeah. and I'm now I'm now trying to persuade Marina to deposit that into Bristol Archives as well. Oh, yeah. It's a that's a great resource from the early days of the of the exchange. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, um, but good. then she will say to me, "Oh, Clive, nobody will be interested in this." Well, but we are. Yes, they will. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they will, Marina. Please, 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 can we see it before we go on? <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I'll get there. She she will she will deposit it at some point. Anybody else? No. Does, does the company still exist, Clive? No, no. I, I, and I, forgive me, I can't remember the name of the company that took them over in uh, when they did when Harry stood down in '74, and that was always one of his big regrets, really. Um, as typical, what happens? You know, when when you pass on ownership to somebody else with a completely different business model. Um, I think they were basically asset stripping, really. Yeah. Um, they, I think that was probably yeah. what happened. Colin, I mean, I don't know if you can add anything to that, but... Um, no, I can't, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it was... I, I, I'm trying, I can't think of the name of the company either, but I'm pretty sure it was asset stripping. Company. Yeah, they, they, they weren't domiciled British company, and I think, no. they, I think it was almost like taking out a competitor as well. Right. Yeah, we'll buy the competitor. We'll take mm. take their own. A tiny, tiny Roland sort of company. It's that that sort of yeah. thing. And and I think Harry always felt felt guilty, really, reading yeah, his sure. sort of reading his handwritten notes. You know, I helped develop this company to what it was. How could I Yeah. Yeah. You know, I can't care for the employees anymore, you know. And I think he left with big, big, big sadness, really. Yes. Uh, for for what subsequently happened, but yeah, you know, that's life. That happens all the time, unfortunately. Or, or you know, it's one of those things. But um, it's hard to take if you've got that kind of, you know, paternalistic view of your your team, if you like. Yes. And even with how he cared for people, there were yeah, you know, there'd be Bristol City footballers whose football careers had ended because of injury, for example. And he nine times out of ten. Would offer them a job at the company. <laughs> so a lot of old, lot of old players ended mm. up working for Brett Muldowen and Rogers mm. um, because he he just felt so you know committed to you know the, the football players or the um, you know or, or, or the workers really. Yeah. yeah. But um, I re I recounted a similar story to Steve Steve Stacy and that was one of the other books we did. A couple of years ago, Steve Stacey was the first black African-American professional footballer in the UK, and he was a Bristol lad and a Bristol City player. Um, but, but Harry Dolman sold Steve Stacey to Wrexham to partly fund the Dolman stand. <laughs> so when I recounted Harry's paternalism to Steve, he said, huh, paternalism, my <laughs> expletive. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> I think Steve had a slightly different view. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, fascinating talk. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. No, nice yeah. to meet. Nice to meet you all, albeit virtually, and hopefully uh, we can meet in person one day. Great stuff. Smashing. Right. Thank Sheila, you, do you have any final comments you want to make? Or? No, no. Really enjoyable. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Sheila. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Super Just stuff. To say, I Thank hope we see you all it. again next time. We've got a, a talk by Chris Biggs, who is a, another Bristolian um, local historian, and he's going to be talking about some of the past trades of Bristol, chocolate, beer, and another one, which I forget for a moment. Tobacco. Tobacco, yeah. thank you. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. How could you forget that? I don't know. <laughs> 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 yeah. Great stuff. Right. Okay. Smashing. Thank you all then. Okay. Um, yeah. This has been recorded. So um, th it will shortly be, we're, uh, shortly the link will be available. So anybody who wants to watch bits of it again or whatever, or to recommend to friends and family they might like to watch it, then uh, there will be a link available and the, the presentation should be available to be watched. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you again, yeah. Clive. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Clive. Thanks, baby. Nice to meet you. Thanks Thanks very much. Good night. Okay, bye bye. Good night, bye. Everybody. Mm. Just waiting for you to disappear. I should stop the recording.